Oh, man. <laughs> hey, guys, welcome back to week eight recap for the Automotive Weekly Waveforms. Um, <laughs> I thought I hit the live button a while ago, and I didn't. So I was hoping to give you guys a few minutes to jam out to some tunes, and that didn't happen. <laughs> so instead, we're going to play the music right now, and Chad's going to jam out. <laughs> No, that wouldn't be fun for anybody. <laughs> Is my mic even on? I don't have audio over here. I'm flying blind. No sound? Okay. Me or him? Hmm. Give me a second here. I'm, I have headphones on. I can't hear it. Okay. Uh, let me know if we still have a sound issue. No, I can hear us now. Okay. It, it, we should have sound. Sorry. Um I would have noticed that sooner, but I have everything muted. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me... I had her turned down on accident. We were, we were testing some new stuff, new setup. Um, let's... We'll jump into it in just a second. This week's assignment, for those of you that haven't seen what we're doing, um, last Sunday I posted a video on camshaft, crankshaft, correlation. The two weeks before that, week number six and seven, was Hall Effect Sensors and Variable Reluctance Sensor. Audio is low. I catch that one either. I have you blasting in my headphones. Okay, is that better? Sorry if I bit a pop in your ears. I had to wiggle the cables. Yeah. Oh, I'm not hooked up. I hear me in the background, not in my mic. Yep, you're tapped on the mic. <laughs> okay. Um, hopefully everything's up and running good. I was I was trying to get a new setup going with Zoom um, for some some guest speakers potentially. So hopefully everything works out there my first time integrating Zoom into my live stream. So I don't know how well that's going to work. We'll see. Um, Valerie is low. I told you. Okay. She moved the microphone closer to her. If I turn her volume up anymore, it gets really hissy. Too much background noise. Yes. Thank you, Angel. Um, I am so thankful for all you guys because through everyone on YouTube, you guys subscribing, I'm um, sharing my content. We just reached 10,000 subscribers, um, two days ago. So that is awesome. Um, so hopefully we can keep it up, keep up the good content and maybe even improve a little bit, but we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, thank you everyone for joining in already. We have quite a few of the usual crowd. I think, I don't think I see any new names yet, but if we do, uh, let me know. And if you guys don't know what this is about every week, I post a, a waveform or a test up on Sunday. They have a Facebook group on um, Automotive Weekly Waveforms on Facebook where you can post up your waveform. So you try to get a waveform capture throughout the week. You take a picture of it, post it up with some information about the vehicle. It doesn't have to be a known good or known bad. We are just trying to get the scope out once a week, get a capture, and and improve our skills a little bit. Whether that's you know acquisition skills or speed of navigation of the scope, Anything we can do to improve a little bit and shave some minutes off of our diagnostic time, it's going to make us a better technician. Um, let me see here. Of course, I forgot to scroll. We'll probably just start at the top and I'll work my way down through the, through the list because I didn't scroll all the way down. And Facebook has changed some settings to where they try to show you just some relevant posts and not all your posts. Um, so look, I hope that it's going to show me all of them. I changed the setting today. I think Jim Morton is the one that posted that up there on Facebook for everyone to see that there was some setting changes. And if you guys are missing posts for the group, then once you have the group open, you need to click the little three dots at the top corner and select see all posts instead of just the relevant ones. Otherwise it may hide some stuff. Yeah. Facebook's all messed up, Doug. Uh, is that Sabian or Sabine? I'm not sure which. Um, Pico says that you're here. Thank you for joining in. It sounded like I was clipping there a little bit. Um, 
That's a name I don't recognize, so I must have missed that one. We got a couple others joining in as well. Neither. <laughs> you might have to, you might have to uh, type it out. Save in. Okay. I, I can get that one. <laughs> Hopefully I can remember it. I'm really bad at names, just to let you guys know. I forget names really rapidly, and I butcher the pronunciation. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can switch screens here and not have everything crash again. Um, give me one second. There we go. That's what I get for messing with settings. So we'll, we'll start with the most recent post. Um, I'll refresh the page after we get through them all. And uh, in case anyone has some late turn-ins and me whipping my hand like that just reminded me of a video that Valerie is watching of like global America's, not America's Got Talent, but Global's Got Talent or something. I don't know. Whatever that lady was dancing and she was just like flipping her hand around. <laughs> she has no idea what I'm talking about. Okay. Daryl Daryl Coffrin, <laughs> 2013 Subaru Outback, Frank and Cam with a cylinder one sink. So let's go ahead and open this up, and he has everything labeled. He's using the Pico Scope, um, 2013. So <clears throat> this looks like it is a timing chain motor. So the F series motor, because um, they have a Hall effect sensor for the camshaft. The older ones have a VR variable reluctance for cam and crank hey Corey, how's it going thanks for joining us are you going to stick around or are you just going to try and get that first comment in <laughs> i think daryl was first today daryl was first he was waiting and he got his homework turned in on time today um, so we have the crank and we have a unique trigger pattern here um, so it has one missing tooth here and it looks like maybe a missing tooth and then a tooth and then another missing tooth and another tooth. Um, so it's a, it's kind of a strange pattern. So we have his, he, he already has it set up here, zero degree markers, 360 and 720. Cause remember the crankshaft turns twice for every rotation of the camshaft. And then he has some markers lining up with the, uh, the cam pulses as well. Um, so we have cams here and here, and then I believe yellow is going to be our ignition sink correct daryl i'm looking here, trying to look at the channels d is coil number one so older subarus are only going to have one cam sensor the newer ones have them on both banks because they have variable valve timing on both banks as well and if you have a some of the wrx's have variable valve timing on intake and exhaust and they'll have four camshaft position sensors Daryl was busy. He posted quite a few. So we have a 2006 Ford LCF. I'm not sure what that is. I'm, I'm guessing that's more of like a commercial truck. Um, 4.5 liter diesel crank no start. So he has the crank and cam relation and then no sync on that one. Um, it's a diesel. It's a little harder to get a sync signal. Medium duty cab over. Um, so we have the crankshaft. It's a variable reluctance. Um, now this is different than most of the Fords we've seen from our VR, uh, weekly waveform. This one is hovering around the zero line. So this one doesn't have a bias voltage like most of the Ford, um, light duty stuff, the cars and trucks. So this one's hovering at zero. The controller on this one's probably made by somebody else. And then we have a camshaft position here as well. And Daryl says that the Fickham was dead on this one and it wouldn't start. So there was no sync. If the Fickham's dead, the injectors will not fire. The Fickham is the fuel injection control module. So he verified that he has a good crank sensor. He has a good cam sensor. And now we need something else to make the vehicle run. And Daryl has a 2013 Toyota Sienna crank and cam and then an in-cylinder pressure transducer on the cylinder number two that's because it's on the front bank number one's hard to get to it's underneath the intake and then he has a bank two intake cam signal 
Um, so we see the crank, variable reluctance. Toyota has used them for years and years. And then up here we see our cam sensor signal. And he has a sink, looks like a maybe a current clamp on cylinder number one, or cylinder number two. Yeah, it says ignition coil primary current. And then we see a compression waveform on that one as well. Um, so on this particular vehicle, it should be a 3.5 liter. This one will actually have four cam sensors and one crank sensor. So if you were tr had a correlation issue and you were scoping it, um, you may have to, if you want to get the whole picture, you may have to scope the crank with two cam sensors and then the crank again with the other two cam sensors to get all your waveforms. But good job on that one, Daryl. All the information, easy to see. Everything's labeled, so I don't have to uh, <laughs> to fumble around on it. Is that the end of Daryl's? That's the end of Daryl's. Okay, I have two things. Yeah. One, can you turn your audio up just a click? Just a click? Just Am a I click. still low? Well, I don't think you went all the way back up to where you were once you muted yourself. Okay, I can move my microphone closer to me as well. And second, happy anniversary, Daryl. Ten years. Ten years. That's all. That's all I had. That's all? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say it before I forgot and also while he's in here. <laughs> just skip that and stay on topic? Okay. Doug's asking us to skip his. His was a, a different post, um, different type of test. Okay, if, if we have some extra time at the end, we'll come back to that one, Doug. Um, that was a discussion about which scope. And that one as well. Here we go. Tom Prince. That's a name I haven't seen in the waveforms. I don't think we had one in there in the past. So if you're new to the group, welcome to the group. And we have a couple of, couple of is it all on one screen? No, we have two different captures here. And he's working on a 2010 Chevy Aveo. Customer replaced the head gasket. Runs but has low power or no power, and it has cam correlation codes. Visually inspected the timing marks, looks good by the eye, put the proper tools in place, and it's off. Uh, so this one says 2010 up here. So I don't know if, if this is a, well, it says bad. So this must not be a known good waveform. Let me see. Well, that, that, uh, 2010, it matches, but maybe this other one is the known good. Or maybe this is afterwards. Yeah, it says says fixed up here at the top. So let me go with the first one. Um, so we can see here, um, and I don't think I have the ability to compare them both side by side, but we have the crank sensor. We have two cam sensors here. Um, if we look, some vehicles will line up their cam sensor signals at some point. The, uh, the falling and rising edges will match. <laughs> Pico says it's a Veo. Of course there's no power. Uh, <laughs> Was that a sneeze? Yeah, I tried to shove my face into the, the microphone. I, I, I shoved my face in the pillow. Um, so let's go to his next waveform and see if the timing is different. I'm just going to try and look here. The rising edge of the cam sensor on this little lobe um, almost falls in the missing gap here, and the other one is back a little ways. Let's see if we can remember that. And then here we have. The rising edge, I'm going to have to bounce back and forth a few times here. Okay, so the red trace looks about the same. The rising edge is almost to the, the missing tooth here, but the blue waveform um, looks like it's shifted. I think, is that advanced? Got double, double. Go back. It's hard for me to see them without putting them side by side. Um, and the scaling's different between the two, which makes it <laughs> a little more challenging. But he said that that he put the tools on, got everything locked down. Now on this one, does it have the floating cam gears? I can't remember on the Aveo um, on a 1.6 if it has keyways on the cam sprockets or if everything just kind of floats. As long as you have the tools for the ones that float, I think it makes it easier. Um, if you don't have the tools, then I would rather just have a timing mark. Okay, it was a keyway. So was it... Now, the Aveos are normally a timing belt motor. Do they have it off a couple teeth? Um, let me see here. 
proper tools in the locking position and it's off. Yeah, I, I can't remember. The, most of the avails I have come in um, are with broken belts, <laughs> and they're not. The customers declined the repairs. Yeah, the crank was off. Okay. So that should have shifted everything. And I guess I could probably see it in this one a little bit better to compare them side by side. And did, did that waveform invert? No, I'm just looking at it funny. Uh, I was talking about inverting waveforms. Some waveforms, like on uh, Nissans, sometimes you'll be watching them, and then the waveform will flip upside down and ride that way for a while and then flip back around. Um, Jason Chavit. Oh, thank, thank you, Tom, for that one. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time to get a capture afterwards after you've confirmed that the vehicle's fixed. Because a lot of guys, once it's fixed and it runs, they ship that thing out the door. They don't they don't grab the capture. Um, but now, since you have the capture, forever on, if that vehicle comes in again, you have a known good waveform. Uh, Jason Chavez has a Kia Optima with a big 2.4 liter cam and crank with ignition sync on cylinder one, coil on plug system, yellow's the crank, green's ignition number one, blue is exhaust cam, red's intake. Um, he said ignition seems to be firing at the 18th tooth of the crank. Special help from me and Kevin with their artistic work, explaining how to determine how many cylinders we have just by looking at the waveform. And thank you for the congratulations, Jason. Um, so Jason sent this one to me and he had a, He's just making sure that he had everything set up right. And I asked him if it was a four cylinder engine um, because I was assuming that it was. And I'll show you how I got to that um, to that point. Um, so here he is counting how many teeth there were to see where his ignition sink was. And then normally the ignition sink isn't you know a big priority of how many teeth we are because that can fluctuate depending on engine speed. Um, the cam, the, like the rising edge on this cam sink would be a better place to measure most of the time unless it has variable valve timing and you don't know if it's your known good waveform is with the solenoids unplugged or plugged back in hey michael nicholson thanks for joining us yeah and angel's right this is a very clean looking capture um and it's very clean for a cell phone picture taking a picture of the scanner screen uh, i don't know if you just cleaned your screen off or what but <laughs> i don't see any dust or anything um, and this one's a little harder to see. We'll move on to the next one and I'll show you how I identified the, uh, how many cylinders this engine had looking at this wider scope view, we can see missing tooth here on the crank, missing tooth here it has a hall effect sensor for the crankshaft. And then it has two hall effect sensors for the camshafts. Normally you want to see your missing tooth for your crank or whatever re repeating pattern you have. You want to see that happen twice because the crank's going to rotate twice for every cam rotation. And then that way you can identify, okay, the crank's rotated twice. I got my cam sense, camshaft has rotated once. I should have all the signals I need on the screen. And that's what Jason has here. He has the total time um, on this screen for two rotations of the crankshaft. Now, can anyone else spot how I identified four cylinders of this engine? I don't think the variable cams typical um, answering Bart's question. I don't think the variable camshafts move much at idle um, because they have lower oil pressure at idle. So they, so they have a harder time controlling the camshaft. So they typically don't do it until, you know, 900 to a thousand RPM. And the automotive doctor, Mr. Wilson says that he can identify four cylinders in this waveform. <clears throat> And Daryl says so as well. Yep. So those of you that are experienced with looking at these types of waveforms uh, may have noticed there is a little glitch in the waveform there and there and there. And I'll skip over and I think I have them all circled. Uh, this is probably the one that I put notes on. So we see, we see a blip here. This one's kind of masked by the ignition spike because we had the, the reference from the ignition. And then that one there and that one there. Now it mirrors down here as well. So sometimes if we don't have a cam sensor that's up high, um, we'll see it down in our other cam sensor that has, you know, a low edge. And looking at that, I can see, you know, the, the noise or the voltage drop from the ignition coil being turned on and charging up. Um, 
and then you know based off of our repeating pattern you know we have the four cylinders um, so if we wanted to measure quite close to what our tdc compression would be we would move our cursors to those marks as well and then we could sorry my, i just had a notification pop up on my my zoom meeting saying that it was ending um, even though i paid for the premium it must not be turned on yet <laughs> We have small voltage changes in the coil are when the coils charge and fire it causes noise and most of the other signals we have so even if we're looking at can communication lines uh, almost any signal on the vehicle we may see little glitches from the ignition noise but almost any engine sensor we're going to see that and then he labeled the firing order one three two four and then one again uh, bob newman has one uh, with notes and with additional service information. Am I muted? No. Can talk you... talk again. Can you mute me? Oh, I can't. I thought that you muted me when I got up. I'm sure <laughs> I can't completely mute you. I can just turn your volume all the way down. <laughs> Sorry. Valerie's eating a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> She's probably ch chomping in the microphone for you guys. Uh, so Bob has a 99 Chevy Cavalier, um, one of his personal vehicles, known good, 2.2 liter engine. Um, and he provided us with the service information regarding how the PCM uses the sensors for that engine. So green is his, I'll open up the waveform in a second. Let me see if it'll show the information while I have it open. Yeah, well, we got lucky on this one. So the green waveform here is the camshaft. And it actually gets pulled all the way up to 12.73, 12 so almost battery voltage. And then we have the crankshaft sensor down here, which is a VR signal. We have ignition sync on cylinder one. It's a waste spark system. So it'll fire twice per, per camshaft revolution. And then <laughs> Bob, Bob always fills in all the details. His annotations are always way cleaner than, than anything that I create. And you guys saw my drawing skills in the last video. Uh, if you made it, if you made it to the end, you, you, you can see, I gave myself a gold star for it. I skipped the video and just went to the end. <laughs> So the camshaft position sensor is used to correlate the crankshaft to camshaft position in order for the PCM to determine which cylinder is ready to be fueled by the injector. It also uses that to determine which cylinder is misfiring. So without a camshaft position sensor, most waste fire engines will still run. And even some non-waste fire engines will still run. Um, they may just fire the coil twice but they don't know how to control the fuel injectors. They think that cylinder one and cylinder four, either one could be on compression, so they're gonna fire the fire it, but they don't know when you know, the intake valve is gonna be open, so they don't know how to properly time the fuel injection. Um, so that's where the camshaft position sensor comes in. Plus, if you don't know where your cam's at, then you don't know which cylinder is misfiring. If cylinder number one or four had a misfire, it couldn't tell the difference between them. Um, Saturn's with the 1.9 liter engine, they don't have a cam sensor, but they will set a cam sensor code at times and they use the different intensity of the spark to be able to tell which cylinders on compression stroke. Um, but they'll still set a cam sensor code, <laughs> even though they don't have it. When the PCM cannot use the info from a sensor, a diagnostic trouble code is set and will fuel the engine using alternating synchronous double fire method. The sensor has no effect on the EI system. I don't know. Is that electronic ignition? Um, and then we couldn't find any information on the ASDF method to provide. Um, maybe the EI is is that even injection? I'm not sure what, what EI is. Um, 
but normally like a sequential injection it'll it'll fire in time for each cylinder but if it doesn't have that then it may have to fire it multiple times or it may have to batch fire both those injectors at the same time um, and more often with a lower duty cycle to keep the fueling the same and then it sends a signal to the ignition control module which the pcm uses as a reference to calculate rpm it uses the crankshaft position um, as well to detect misfires so it's really looking at the crankshaft for the engine acceleration and deceleration because it's a higher frequency signal um, so it knows when a misfire happened and then it uses the camshaft to synchronize that to know exactly which cylinder so it knows when it happened it uses the camshaft to identify what cylinder is causing it great details bob thank you for all the information and then josh says he's sorry <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably get in trouble for having that on my live stream. <laughs> Copyright infringement. Uh, Randall has one. Um, we'll have to look at them sideways here, I think. I, I might be able to download them and flip them. But he has a 2010 Silverado 5.3. He's back probed at the ECM. He has cam, crank, and cylinder one sync. He was using the Autel tablet instead of the laptop. And then he had some, he's wondering why there's ripples in the cam sensor lineup with the crank sensor missing tooth. Could it be because my grounds were piggybacked? Um, he's going to try again with the laptop and see if it only happens when using the tablet. Okay. Um, so he's talking about, there's a little glitch right here. Oh, actually the whole thing. Um, so he has a signal here that mimics what is happening on the crankshaft. But we also have the regular Hall effect sensor as well. And more than likely it was a poor ground. Now stacking the grounds shouldn't matter too much, but if both those grounds aren't connected well, properly to the engine, um, then the Pico scope will do the same thing. And it, it's confused me numerous times when I've had a bad ground or even a bad cable. And that may be what's causing it as well. If you have a bad cable on your Autel scope, then you could get a, an issue like this whether the ground is shorted to the signal or uh, which normally you'd have no signal at that point or the ground is open circuit. And I think he circled the, the problem area, which is yeah, right there. So yeah, it's more than likely a ground issue and my Pico scope, if I plug it into my laptop and the connection isn't good, then my waveforms all over the place and I just wiggle the USB cable and it improves greatly. And I'm, but I have like a 15 foot USB cable on my Pico scope. I remember my Pico scope came with a different USB cable from auto nerds that had like wider, uh, contact patches to, to limit that kind of interaction or that, you know, bad cable response. But I broke that cable by shutting it in the drawer of my toolbox. So I'm using a different one that's a little bit longer. <laughs> and Kevin said that the bad cable made his pictures post sideways as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll just blame it all on the cables. <laughs> Paul Smith, two birds with one stone. Um, homework and a noise study. So he had a 2008 Hyundai Sonata 2.4 with noise present with the engine running. Setting a P0011 cam position timing advanced bank one. He could hear a noise in the upper end as well. So he removed the valve cover and found some wear on the head. Uh, and we had a little discussion about this as well. And he talked about, um, Hans has a video using a, a piezoelectric sensor as a noise detector to kind of isolate some noises. Um, so I'm going to open this up and then we'll discuss it. So he has his crankshaft position sensor here. Um, and this one actually has a missing tooth that rises up um, instead of the pulled the missing tooth going down like we normally see and then he has his camshaft sink as well and then he was using the noise sensor here and i can't remember if this had it lined up okay so the noise is happening right here and he has a a sink here but since it's in the top end if it's a valve train noise it's really hard to isolate when that noise is happening because especially if it's like a valve clearance issue or a lifter issue it's hard to it's hard to calculate when 
the cam lobe is getting ready to make contact with the rocker arm or the valve, whatever it may be, the, the shim, the bucket. Um, it's, it's hard to calculate when that's actually going to happen. Sometimes you can do it with an in-cylinder compression waveform based off of the intake and valve openings, but I always have a hard time isolating those noises. And the shiny marks that we were, that, that Paul was concerned about, um, are these ones down here in the head. Um, but after looking at it, I was thinking that these valve lifters are right underneath the lobe and the valves underneath that, and it should be pushing the cam away from it, but at the same time, it's gonna push it towards the edge of the head, I guess down this way. Um, so it could get make it get close, but those also may just be machining marks from when they went in and, and bored out this stuff, I'm not sure. Um, I've had a couple of these Hyundai engines with plugged up oil filters causing low oil, and it'll, it'll actually uh, cause the VVT system to rattle but it only causes it to, to rattle when you're coming to a stop. So the VVT is actuated at higher RPMs um, or above 1,000 RPM. And once you come below 1,000 RPM, the particular vehicle I was working on, I've actually had two or three of them, um, the oil pressure is too low for it to supply oil to that phaser and get it into the locked position before we come down to an idle. And it'll start rattling and it stays advanced or retarded, whichever way that cam particularly goes and it'll cause the engine to stall. And <laughs> Corey says, is that AF? Is that after? I'm thinking aftermarket oil filters and Hyundai's will do the same thing. Um, I think that that's what he's saying. Um, we have, yeah, we started stocking OEM Hyundai oil filters after I ran into that issue. So I now stock OEM Toyota, Nissan, Subaru, Hyundai um, oil filters just because we've had too many issues and we're, we're not using cheap aftermarket filters and, and they've had they've come in with different types of filters. It doesn't matter if it's Fram, uh, Wix, um, any aftermarket filter, it may not perform exactly like the OEM. but. If the filter's plugged up, what's it plugged up with? It's probably plugged up with metal from the engine because it started to fail. And once it starts to plug up, it starts, the bypass doesn't work properly and it starves the engine for more oil and more damage happens. It just goes to the point that you have a junk engine. Thank you, Paul, for sharing that one. And Angel has one. 2013 Ford Fusion 2.0 liter hybrid, 90,000 miles, known good. Uh, the exhaust is not being monitored, so he used the extra channel to show camshaft advancement. This capture was taken at startup in the bay at in park. Um, all measurements were taken at the components. Grounds were all connected to a single ground at the breakout box. Uh, did you have a breakout box on the on the data link connector on that one? Uh, hope everyone is doing well. Thank you, Angel. Uh, we are doing well here. Hopefully everyone else out there is doing well as well. <laughs> and we have our crankshaft down here. Crankshaft's almost always our higher resolution signal, except for vehicles that don't have a crankshaft, um, like 7.3 power strokes. Um, they use everything. All the information is done off the cam sen sensor, which is why when they fail, they don't run anymore and then we have we actually have a double spark ignition which is common on fords we have our cam sensor signal here and then what was the yellow channel here timing solenoid control so right now it's not being controlled i don't think uh, we're sitting at battery voltage normally we'll see a pulse with modulated control on that one and then here we can see the pulse with modulation happening on that timing control. So let me jump back. We'll try and look at where our cam sync is and then we'll jump back forward and see where that timing control is happening. Um, so we have this double pulse here and it is happening maybe one tooth after our missing tooth. So let's go forward here. And now our camshaft has advanced probably one, two, three, four, five, like six teeth. So. <laughs> So Corey has actually seen it with brand new aftermarket filters. 
The science behind the aftermarket filters is actually better than the OE sometimes. The side effect is they tend to restrict oil flow and reduce oil pressure. Oh, I'm out of focus? Oh, the, 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 the image. I'm small, so you guys don't need to see me. Um, let me see if I can move this a little bit on the screen here. Wrong screen. <laughs> uh, it, it's a little blurry, but the PicoScope writes such a fine line on the screen, um, it's hard to hard to display it. So most of the Fords will do multi-strike at idle. Um, the Ford trucks will do three strikes, and then once you get up to about 900 to 1,000 RPM, they drop it down to two strikes, and then above that... Um, they, they go to a single strike. And I really like the Ford multi-strike ignition. Um, I think it's our cover photo for the Facebook group. It, they fail often. So I get a chance to scope them often and their scope captures look kind of cool. Um, so yeah, we, we advance, it looks like five or six teeth of the crankshaft, um, without throwing up some, some measurements on here. I don't know what the exact degrees are. Thank you, Angel. We have Michael Mack with the 2001 Toyota Camry 2.2 liter engine, known good cam and crank. Uh, this is a timing belt engine. And this is his second week eight homework assignment. So we'll, we'll find his first uh, week here shortly. Camshaft signal seems to be aligning with every second crankshaft rotation or every 720 degrees. Um, and, and it's pretty close. Now we do have a weird little hiccup here. I wonder what that's caused by, um, but we have the high resolution crank. We have the missing tooth on the crank and then the camshaft here, depending on when the computer reads the, the missing tooth, if we zoomed in, we're probably, you know, the peak of this one is, you know, probably a, a tooth and a half in on the crankshaft here. And then was there another one? Oh, well, we'll, we'll get down to the second one. I, I was thinking two in this one. Um, yeah, there must be a little bit of an anomaly in the in the camshaft where that trigger wheel is, um, which 2.2, that might have a distributor. So there might be a little bump in it right there causing that extra hiccup, but it may not be going above or below the threshold enough to throw the computer off. And I can't remember if 2001 still had that same 2.2 with the distributor on the back of the engine. And Doug Wilson has a 2017. So we're, we're talking fairly new stuff here. Ford Expedition, 3.5 liter turbo, 24 valve. He did not verify if it's a known good or known bad. Now Doug has a eight channel scope, uh, the ATS Elite. So he's able to capture the crankshaft and all four camshaft posi posi position sensors at once. Um, so we see, looks like the crank is down here. This is probably ignition sync, uh, multi-strike ignition. And then we have our camshafts. And so it looks like they all kind of have a similar pattern, a, a group of three and then one, and then maybe another group of three. Um, and they all kind of are staggered differently. But it looks like the white and the red, they both have spots where they line up, where the two rising edges and dropping edges will, uh, will line up. And then... But you can see they're kind of shifted from each other. And then the intakes both line up perfectly. Um, so not sure why Ford didn't make the exhaust line up perfectly on this one. Um, <laughs> it, it's hard to say. So white and red is the, the exhaust. So red because it's hot and white because you're going to get a blister if you touch it. Oh, and we have the uh, the channel details here. If I would have went to the next screen, I would have seen everything. <laughs> um, so ATS has a ability to put all the information in. PicoScope does the same same thing, but I do kind of like the layout here. Um, it's a little easier to read. And I love it whenever all the information is saved, especially when you're looking at a known good waveform. Because you want to make sure that all your stuff lines up with theirs. And was that it? Okay. Uh, Jason said that Michael drew, drew something on his, uh, on his post. So 
I'm going to have to scroll up and I may have to refresh the page here. And Angel's asking, Dr. Wilson, was this a problem vehicle? Hence why you said not verified. Uh, let me see here. Okay, we have uh, Juan has posted a 2016 Jetta. Now, this isn't Cam and Crank. Um, actually, this one doesn't. This one doesn't apply to any of our waveforms yet. I don't think he didn't. He didn't label it with a week. Um, he just posted up a known good waveform of the power feed on the injectors. So no, no week on that one. And I'm I'm looking through here. I want to see which one you guys are talking about. Uh, Jason said that, that Mac drew shades on him. Let's see here. Did I miss it? On, uh, <laughs> Michael Mac drew some shades on Jason. Cause Kevin forgot to draw a picture with his glasses on this week. So, so Michael wanted to, to make sure that we had his glasses on. <laughs> um, I think that's, I think that was it for the, the turn-ins, unless Facebook has just skipped some, some folks. It was a comment on one of his picks. Okay, let me go in here. Let me know if I missed your waveform, and I will uh, dig a little bit deeper for the waveform. Well, Doug put a dog with some glasses on with windshield wiper blades. <laughs> oh man. Wait, maybe it's in the first one. There was more comments there. Oh, here we go. So we got some sweet shades. Oh, that, that is not accurate at all because you only get mountains like that in Colorado. <laughs> and Jason hasn't been out here to visit. <laughs> uh, Doug says that his Cadillac's missing. Okay. Let me, uh, let me scroll through here and, and see. It, it probably just, just moved it. Maybe I didn't go back far enough. Oh, no, I didn't. I stopped at this waveform. But we, ha we have more to go. Um, Eduardo posted up his week one assignment. That's what threw me off. This was a 2015 Tucson. Uh, tested the battery and it failed. And then he grabbed his U-scope and did the battery voltage drop test. 12.8 um, to start, which is a little high. May have a, had a surface charge. And then it dropped down to 8.8 .8 while cranking. Um, but I wonder what the battery tester showed for, uh, for CCAs. So we got another use U scope user working their way through the uh, waveforms. Okay, we got more to go. Don't don't worry. Uh, two thousand, not two thousand. It's a Toyota Hilux three point oh D four D. I believe that's a direct injection four cylinder diesel. Um, I can't remember if that's what that means. Um, Channel one is crank. Channel one is injector number one amp clamp, and channel three is a cam sensor. And this is the USB auto scope, I believe. So we have the high resolution re resolution crank. We have our injector signal. Um, being a diesel, we don't have any spark. Um, and then we have our cam sync. And then this waveform is zoomed out so we can get two rotations of the crankshaft. Thank you, David. Always bring in the... Uh, the diesel vehicles that we don't get to see very often. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, I just got disoriented. <clears throat> I was actually, I, I got disappointed earlier um, because I made, I made a purchasing mistake with some, some wheels and tires. <laughs> So Joseph has a cam and crank from a Acura 2.5 TL. Um, 
So we just have the one cam and one crank. Crank's a high resolution sensor. It has a missing tooth going up. So it's a, you know, it's, it's getting pulled up. And I'm not sure on this one without, you know, testing it, um, if it's a pull down or pull up design sensor. Um, but not, we don't see the, the missing tooth going up very often. Almost always there, it's a low. And then we have a almost inverting pattern um, for half the rotation. It's high and then has low dropouts and then flips, flip flops. You know, I don't know if I've seen an Acura TL with the 2.5 in the shop. We don't have to do a lot of repair work on Hondas or Acuras. We just do a lot of, uh, a lot of maintenance. So Doug Wilson also has a wheel speed sensor. Um, so this was a VR sensor for the wheel speed and he was having an issue. Um, I think he has another capture here. Okay. So this is the amplitude on one wheel speed sensor and this was the amplitude on the other one. So it was dropping out quite a bit and he shows some scanner data of one drops off sooner than all the other ones. So whenever that happens, you can have a false ABS activation. So we can use our VR testing skills to apply them to other sensors on the vehicle that are not the cam sensor or crank sensor. <laughs> Kevin says, yeah, this was recorded earlier. <laughs> it's, I'm doing it like a premiere, but, but it's live. Uh, Troy hasn't posted anything. He says he's going back to work tomorrow. Michael Mack, week number eight, homework submitted. So this is his other post. We saw the second post a little bit ago. Um, 2003 Toyota Camry 2.4 liter. Unless I may be losing it. Crank and cam. Uh, let's see, we got three different pictures here, probably different zoom levels. So we have one rotation of the crank on that zoom level. And then we have multiple here. Um, just making sure that, that it didn't have a double missing tooth because we've seen that quite a few times here. So we have a full rotation with three triggers of the cam sensor. And which engine was this? Did it say? 2.4 liter. So that same three trigger pulse is what I had in the Highlander with the V6. The other ones were blurry. I see. And this zoomed out a little bit more. So we can see a repeating pattern. And sometimes it's nice to get a, a capture that's zoomed out further than all the other ones. Um, so you, you can see if there's a glitch or a dropout. <laughs> Jira has a week eight assignment complete. Uh, we can count it for week seven as well. <laughs> we have a 2015 Scion toaster. Known good. Um, it appears to have a flat spot after the first cam tooth lines up. And then after it lines up with the crank identifier, the crank sensor was taken at the connector by the valve cover and the cam sensor was taken directly off the sensor. Ground was placed on the valve cover. Capture was at idle. Um, so I'm glad to see that I'm not the only one that calls those things toasters. Um, the Honda, Honda Element also looks like a toaster. It's just a slightly larger toaster. So he said we had a flat spot here. I'm trying to trying to figure that one out. I don't see it in this waveform. Do what? Oh, no, these are. <laughs> Talk. Valerie's over here trolling me. <laughs> um, let me let me reread that to see where the flat spot is. It appears that the flat spot after the first cam tooth lines up with the crank identifier. I see. Um, he's talking about this area right here. After this cam pulse, we have a flat spot and that lines up with the crank uh, missing tooth. I thought there was going to be a, a, like a glitch in the cam waveform. <laughs> Scion toaster. And it seems like those things eat engines for some reason. They, as soon as they get a coolant leak, they're done. <laughs> Um, so week seven, because it's a VR sensor week eight, because he has cam and crank correlation. John Webb has a 2010 Mazda three, 2.0 liter known good cam and crank are both hall effect lineup cursor number one and two with a complete revolution. He believes, uh, channel one is at the crank sensor back probed at the ECM channel two is back probed at the cam sensor. 
Um, so we have a, a missing tooth and then a pulse and then another missing tooth there. And then again here, but we can note, we can see that our cam, you know, doesn't line up the same. So, so this is one revolution of the crank and then we have another missing tooth and then we have that same pattern again. So there's our other revolution of the crank and he lined up the cursors on the cam pulse. And sometimes it's easier to line them up on the cam pulse. And one of Kevin's suggestions, um, was to look for an ignition sink. I believe Jason did that in the last week capture is if you have an ignition sink ability to get that in there, then sometimes it's easier to line it up on the ignition sink because you can see the complete um, two rotations of the crankshaft. And he shows where he's connected at. So battery ground there, back probed at the ECM and that one at the cam sensor. I like when everything's just nice and easy to get to like that. No, nothing over the coils. Um, you have a connector here that probably feeds the injectors. Nice and easy. Seward has another one here, 2008 Hyundai i30 1.6 liter turbo diesel. We have a high resolution crank sensor and just a single sync pulse on the camshaft. So it's probably not using the camshaft for a whole lot of information. Um, a lot of the diesels don't have variable valve timing, so they don't need multiple teeth in there. Um, so pretty, uh, pretty simple system on that one. And I wonder if they go with the VR sensor on the crank sensor because it's cheaper or if it's because it's more reliable. They don't fail as often as the Hall Effect sensors. Okay, he said he, he inverted the waveform. Uh, the waveform in the first capture was, was flip-flopped, so he inverted it and saved it again. Uh, Nicholas was asking for a known good waveform, I think or showing his, but he does have a cam and crank here. It's a MK7 GTI. So MK7, is that like a 2011 or 12? Um, I don't work on a lot of them, so I, I don't know the cutoff. <laughs> Jason says stop picking on him. He's still, he's still here. <laughs> you guys can't talk bad about him until he leaves. Doug has a 2010 Cadillac CTS 3.0 cam and crank and ignition control on cylinder one so you using the power of that eight channel scope again um, i think he said his intakes lined up let me and i i did look and i didn't have a known good waveform for this vehicle um so we can see that these two cams line up perfectly and then these ones have a slight offset 2015 um, Pico is saying on the MK7. Um, so yeah, it's it's. I find it weird when manufacturers have a slight offset. Like, why can't they just make it the same? Um, it would make it so much easier for us to identify if there's an issue. Um, but but maybe this one had an issue. Maybe maybe one uh, one cylinder wasn't 100% right, but it wasn't beyond the threshold to set a code. Not sure. It could be normal. Um, this is a waveform. Okay, this is with them all separated out. So we see the crank sensor here, and we're zoomed in a little bit more. We can see that these two line up, and then we can see a little bit better the offset in this one. So it's almost half a tooth um, of the camshaft, but it's multiple teeth of the crankshaft. So anything that far should set a code. <laughs> um week number eight 2019 gmc six liter cam and crank um jason didn't say where he tested it at but depending on oh I'll, let me read it okay so these are back probed at the ecm the gm uses hall effect on the cam and the crank um missing tooth and we see our camshaft sensor as well um, I, I like it when they make something that lines up with the missing tooth. This one's close, but not quite. 
but depending on the engine, this probably has variable valve timing as well, which shouldn't be activated at idle, but maybe that's why they're not lining it up with the, the missing tooth there. I don't think there was a scope capture with that one. And this was, that was last week's um, from Bob. Pico had one, um, just another capture for a blower motor. And they showed, showed some carnage in the blower motor as well. Um, some dropouts in the, uh, the current waveform. We have Chris with a 99 Ford Expedition 5.4 liter cam and crank, known good. So let me click on this one. So this is gonna be the, uh, the two valve Triton modular engine. This is before they went with the three valve. Now looking at this, we have some pulses here that could be caused by the same type of ground issue that we were talking about earlier. Um, if the scope was grounded a little iffy, um, you may get this weird pattern in there. Um, no one good. So we have missing tooth here on the crank, missing tooth here. So this would be one revolution from this point to this point, and then the whole thing repeats itself again. They only have one cam sensor, and that is on the bank two cam, driver's side of the engine. <laughs> Kevin says his next scope is going to have 12 channels. <laughs> <clears throat> um, let's see. That might have been the last one we covered from last week. So did I miss anybody else's waveforms? I think I will go over Kevin's again from week seven because he did have a lot of good information in that one. Um, so this is one that he had with bad timing. If you guys missed this one last week, Kevin has all kinds of good notes on here. Um, he marked how many teeth there are. He marked where the cam should be and where the cam actually was. And this is on a two valve as well. So bank two cam timing sensors only on one bank. And then let's go to the next one. So he has 360 degrees of the crank rotation. So this is his math for step one. And he measures how long. So if you're using the snap on and you're doing the math manually, um, this will help you a lot. Um, so if I, if I butcher this, then jump back through and look at Kevin's notes. And he did 360 degrees divided by the 71 milliseconds that we have. So he has five degrees per millisecond. And then he measured from this point to this point where the, where the lower lobe is here on that cam pulse. And since we know that each crankshaft degree is five, crankshaft degree per millisecond is five degrees. Then time from cursor one to two is 16 milliseconds. So you multiply those and you end up with 83 degrees. So the camshaft is 83 degrees from our timing mark of the camshaft. Now that doesn't say that we're 80 degrees off. Um, you gotta go through all the steps before you jump to conclusions like I did last time. And then he took a known good waveform and measured it. And the crank to the cam is approximately 6.25 teeth which would put this cursor number two at the proper location right here. So then he looked at the bottom to get his 12 milliseconds and did the same math of cursor one to two is 12 milliseconds. So now we have 12.47 times 5.023 equals 62. So the difference between those, the 83 degrees and the 62 degrees equals 20 degrees of retarded timing. And then this is the known good waveform. Now keep in mind the cam sensor is inverted on this one. Um, the, the probe was probably just in the wrong wire or the other wire. And as long as you realize that the waveforms are inverted, you can measure them the same. You don't need to have a properly inverted waveform to do the measurement. You just have to measure from the same point, even if it's upside down. And then he shows how many... Uh, how many teeth are on here there's 36 including the missing tooth and 36 and we have 360 degrees of rotation equals 10 degrees of uh, 10 degrees per sprocket tooth so 20 degrees of timing off is two sprocket teeth of what he was expecting to see on that timing chain when he took it apart 
thank you for all the detail on that one, Kevin. Um, that is a great post. And anyone that's looking to do the math manually, um, that is a great place to, uh, to get it done. And then this one might have been, let's see here. This, this might be applied to this week as well. Chad Coleman has one. I'm not sure if we covered this one in the last week or not. 97 Chevy with a 5.7 with a stretch timing chain before and after. And then he has a follow-up for the week six assignment that he posted in week six. Um, he had an unknown cam and crank on a 2011 Buick 3.6 but he has since captured a known good from a 2008 Enclave that he did chains on. So here we have one with stretch chains. Um, there's no measurements on this one, but in his notes it says stretch timing chain VIN R. And then he has it zoomed in here. Um, the offset between those teeth is three degrees. He has a 720 degree markers. If you're using the Pico scope, these have the markers built in. They are the little green dots on the right hand side of the screen. If you drag those over and place those cursors and then drag your other measurement tool or the other cursor over from the left, it'll tell you how many degrees your cursor is. So it says that which degree both cursor is and the difference between those, which gave him the 3.196 degrees off of the timing there. And then... This one here, he was 11 degrees from this timing mark to that tooth. So if we do the, the 3 and 11, you know, he's a 7 degrees of difference just from the timing chain stretch. And then here he has the ATS scope out. And these intake cams line up. He shows a 27 degree offset of the exhaust camshafts. And this one was an unknown. And then this one was a known good that he had done chains on a couple of years ago. Um, intake cams line up and 23 degree offset of the exhaust cams. So uh, 27 and what was this one? 23. So one did have an issue, I'm assuming. Um, four degrees of offset could indicate some, some chain stretch, which is <laughs> pretty common on the 3.6. And then this is one I... I believe this is one that he found on the internet and it was 23 degrees of offset on the exhaust cams. So going back to Doug Wilson's capture, um, let me scroll back up to his Cadillac. I'm not sure if you had the offset in that one, Doug, if you had any measurements on that one. Um, no, I don't see the measurement marks unless I'm missing them, but we could, Doug could go through this one and see, uh, <laughs> see if they're the same or not <clears throat> yeah his are offset but i was just thinking about the uh the degrees of offset now let me go all the way back to the top make sure i didn't miss any new posts i don't see any new ones <laughs> um, so let me know if you guys have any questions on this one. I know that it was a little bit of a repeat for the last couple of weeks, um, considering that we had Hall effect sensors for week six, the VR sensors for week seven, and many of you guys posted both those cam crank correlations in the past. Um, but for the new users, I like to build it up now for, for next week, um, I'm going to give you guys some, some options here. I went and filmed some stuff today and I'm not sure exactly which way we want to go. We've been working on camshaft crankshaft correlation, but I don't want to dive too deep, um, too quickly or skip over something that's kind of important. So we could, we could continue with cam and crank correlations and offsets and variable, variable valve timing control, or we can move into ignition. Um, variable valve timing control solenoids are normally just a, a duty cycle solenoid. And it's 
the signal is very much like a Hall effect sensor, only it's a, a varying duty cycle. Um, but, you know, we have the option to jump into ignition um, if you guys want. Or we can do, do injection. I was working on ignition stuff today, and it's going to be a longer video. Um, I don't think that there's any way that I can do even covering the basics of ignition scope captures without it being a long video. Um, so no, no matter what I do, it's going to be a long video to film and edit. And I am by no means an ignition expert. I know enough to get me in trouble and get me to start questioning or, or looking too deep into a waveform when it's, uh, <laughs> when it's probably not that big of a deal, but I think that ignition plays a big role in how the engine runs. Um, so we are going to spend a little bit of time on it. I just didn't know if that's what you guys wanted to do next. NC Basson says ignition, please. So I think based off of the tools and equipment that we've used so far, we don't have an issue jumping into ignition. That, that would be pretty awesome if we could bring Mr. Morton in as a special guest. <laughs> and I, I think Valerie actually mentioned that a couple of weeks ago of, of bringing in some of these experts in the industry as special guests, you know, for these, for these captures. Um, I don't know if I can pull it off though. Actually, I think I recommended bringing me in <laughs> as a special guest expert. I'm not sure if you guys could hear Valerie or not since her microphone's turned down. <laughs> But she said that we can invite her in as a special guest. <laughs> yes, Jim does a very good job explaining ignition. Um, the thing is, a lot of our older trainers and technicians have a lot more experience with ignition waveforms than the younger generation because the older vehicles didn't have anything else. And everything relied on ignition. And they used old school ignition scopes and they got used to looking at the waveforms over and over again. Um, so it was kind of ingrained into them and they could look at that scope and determine, um, issues based off of the scope captures. The modern vehicles, they kind of change everything up and no two vehicles seem to be the same a hundred percent on the ignition stuff. But yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll continue on with the, with the ignition system next and then 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 we'll get into some other stuff but we'll, we have quite a bit to cover with ignition so i think we'll we'll start on that now since we're since we're caught up uh doug said that he had some ignition waveforms posted on that 88 ford with the shorted plug let me scroll down here so this one was an 88 Ford uh, 350. I'm probably a truck F350 with a 7.5 liter big block suspecting cylinder washout. I'm um, looking into, but the cadence had me wanting to take a quick look at the relative compression. So he did a relative compression check first. One cylinder was low. Um, was this relative compression here? Let me go back. So we have the relative compression with sync signal. Um, now looking here, you know, I don't see a big difference here. I don't see a comment on this one. So let me know, Doug, if this is not the relative compression post. Um, and then we have, it says cylinder is leaking. So it's leaking, leaking compression. Is that going to be your pulse sensor, like in a, in a dipstick tube? Okay, so this one is voltage drop. Oh, it's in another post. I see. Let me, holy cow, 51 comments on this one. <laughs> okay, so we're going to look at the ignition system here. Um, was this ignition primary or secondary? We have a waveform here, and with ignition systems, um, I will cover all of this in a another another video as well. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you guys to see. Um, it's one of those things, a lot of things that we test on a vehicle is going to be which one of these things is not like the other. 
a lot of our patterns are repeating if we see a signal that is different than all the other signals that is normally where our problem is at whether you are testing ignition coils or injectors um, or wheel speed sensors you got four wheel speed sensors on the car if one of them doesn't have the same signal as all the other ones that's probably your problem so this was a secondary capture and he said said six i'm guessing that's that cylinder six so we see we see some waveforms you know they all kind of flatten out here we drop we see some os oscillations jumps back up we see a spike rises or flattens out and rises again we see the oscillations but over here we see one that slopes down um, whether or not we had an issue there or not and then over here we see one that has a lot of noise um, and, a, and a steep rising edge so we have potentially two that are you know quite a bit different than the other ones um, and those would be the ones that that I would target. Let me see if there's uh, more more posts in here. Since there's 51 comments, Doug may have some uh, some additional images. Uh, we have a cylinder six plug here with a lot of ash and a lot of carbon buildup. And he put new spark plugs in it, um, and they all have almost the same same waveform this one here rises up quite a bit so i'm not sure what's going on with that one doug says we got to go deep <laughs> got to go deep in the comments on this one so at idle we have a fuel flow issue um it's hard to start after shutdown he's going to look into the fuel system tomorrow so he's another post here and that's a bad thing sometimes you have to put new spark plugs in in order to read the ignition system properly you can get an idea of what's going on by looking at the old plugs but until you have a fresh set of plugs that are working properly um, you may not be able to tell what else is going on so that's where it makes a you got to make the point to test it again after you you know have it repaired um let me scroll down here for some more pictures <laughs> Doug Wilson has the big screen TV going on. He shows some of the in injector control here. So all kinds of, you know, you can't just scope the new vehicles. Old vehicles need scope too. This is an 88 and Doug is scoping everything. So we have injector control. Um, we see, I can see pental movement by looking at this. I can see that the injector at least had movement and tried to close, uh, but doesn't mean it's not leaking. And he says that he had fuel spraying out of the regulator. So it wasn't actually an injector leaking. It was the regulator leaking fuel into the intake, causing his waveforms to be messed up. Now, I've had some of these Fords where the regulator doesn't leak, but the regulator will stick and they'll have like 80 pounds of fuel pressure. Um, and he's using multiple different scopes, Snap-on. Um, Snap-on does ignition testing quite well. So if you guys are using the Snap-on and you've felt a little left out, like, oh, I don't have all the zoom features or the cursor features that some of the other guys have, um, we will excel a little bit when it comes to ignition because it, there's some cool features built into the Snap-on scope. So he had low pressure on this one um, and the regulator was leaking. And sometimes when that diaphragm is bad, and, and ruptured, uh, your fuel pressure will not operate correctly or the regulator. Let me fly back up here, refresh one more time, make sure I didn't miss it. Um, I think that was it for the new captures. So I still have to edit the video for tomorrow. Um, I hope that everything filming wise uh, worked out all right. Um, I, I think my microphone died at some point. I don't know if it was during that filming or my Highlander. Um, I'm hoping that it lasted through all the first filming. Um, otherwise I'll have to go reshoot some stuff, but it'll be all right. So if there's no other questions, then we will uh, we'll sign off for tonight. I'll give you guys a few minutes. Let me make maybe make sure I didn't <laughs> uh, didn't miss anything. Kevin says he made some corrections on the injector batch fire numbers. Let me let me scroll back down here as well. 
Was that on this one? Okay. Let me let me flip this open. Uh, so the injectors are not sequentially fired on this one. They are batch fired. So we have one full bank controlled right here. We have the other bank um, coming down and controlled here. <laughs> oh, um, I almost forgot one. And and I, if, if you haven't left, please stay. Um, I, have, I forgot Pico sent me the file on his, um, so I will cover that now. Now, let me know. I'll have to resend a, I'll, another Zoom meeting if you guys wanted to join. Okay, we can't get Zoom to work. Um, oh, it's okay. I'll just cover it here. And where is... Let me switch, switch screens here. So you guys can see that, I think. Um, is that blurry for you guys? Let me try and change the scaling a bit. Let me know if you can't if you can't read that. Um, I'm going to read through the notes because the notes will probably be hard to see. So this is one that um, Jonathan posted in the. He might post a capture in the group. I don't think he has yet, but he sent this to me to cover because it had a lot of information in it. Um, we we're going to try and get him into the into a Zoom call. But I, <laughs> I had some technical difficulties and didn't get set up until really late. Um, and they were having some difficulties on their end as well. And my Zoom meeting ended already. So this is one they were back probing at the ECM. It is a 2003 Toyota Corolla, no start. And they had a crank sig signal dropout. So they were back probing at the ECM. They noticed the engine oil was present at terminal... 26 of 26 and I'm guessing that's a typo there's probably two wires but two wires at the ECM had oil at them and they both went to the cam and crank sensor you can see the see the blue reference waveform went up and down a bit while they were wiggling the wire so I'll probably have to zoom out on this one um, to see where the where the changes are and then while he was wiggling the wires at the ECM the car quit and now it will not start so let me zoom all the way out here and zoom back in right here. Uh, so they start started cranking up the vehicle. We see a cam sensor first and we see a weak crank sensor signal. Now VR signals get stronger with engine speed. So the faster the engine goes, the, the higher we're going to see a waveform. Um, I'm surprised it picked up the cam sensor before the crank, but if there's an issue, especially wire uh, oil in the wiring harness, then that could be the cause of it. We see our first ignition pulse here. But looking at this waveform, um, I don't know if it's a ground issue. I don't think it is because we're not seeing the same pattern in all of our traces. But we're seeing a little bit of a glitch, a bleed over between our crank sensor and cam sensor signals. The channels are in the notes. Okay, so crank is back probed at the ECM behind the glove box at the black wire. Ignition secondary voltage has, they have the number one coil removed and a high high tension lead installed with a HT pickup on there. So the inductive pickup is around the, the wire that they installed. And they have yellow at the injector number one. And camshaft is above the throttle body at the engine um, at the sensor itself. And there's continuity between the cam and crank at the ECM when measured with a, a DVOM. So let me go back here. Right here, I'm guessing is the, the issue area. So we have some bleed over in the signal there. We go back one screen and we lose the bleed over here, but we also lose our crank, crank sensor signal. And all we have left is the cam. And I'm guessing that's when it stalled because it looks like it quit firing. Um, is that the injector or the, the coil? Zoomed in too far. That, that could... That's our ignition coil sink there. Our injector is the green trace, which I can drop down here. Um, so we have a section where we miss the fuel injection cycle. We miss spark. Um, at this point, it probably stumbled and then picked back up because we don't see a cranking event. And we have 
our crank sensor picks back up again and so does our noise or our bleed through over to the cam sensor. So let me scroll over to the right, Oop, too far. Zoom out. And I'm guessing this is where the vehicle finally stalled. So they're wiggling wiring harness and we lost the crank again. Engine speed dropped down. We still have a cam sensor. And then we pick up a little bit of crank here, but it's not enough to get it going again and it stalls out. Try, try zoom again. Okay. Now Valerie was telling me that I needed to have the premium zoom um, because <laughs> the regular zoom cuts you off too early. Um, so Sabin, I think, is is wanting to try the zoom again to see if he can jump in and explain it better than I can because I'm not doing a very good job. Uh, we're going to try it one more time here. Did you send me the link on this one? You're going to need a new link. Um, give me one second and I'll see if I can get this figured out. Cause it, I got a message saying that it kicked me out like pro probably an hour ago now. <laughs> so... Let me see. I think I have Zoom pulled back up and I'll send a. No, no, no. Gotta, gotta invite him in. Bear with me one more second. One more. <laughs> Okay, um, Pico, you'll have to forward this link over to him, and then we'll we'll try we'll try joining in the Zoom meeting again. Um, if we have technical difficulties, bear with me. I am new to Zoom, and I'll have to figure a few things out. Um, that's not what I want, and. Saving if you're joining in and you're using the same phone for for YouTube and the and the chat, then um, as long as your YouTube's muted, then you'll be fine. If you're using two different devices, like you're playing on the TV or the computer, you'll have to mute the one. Otherwise, we'll get like a weird feedback loop going on. Let's see if if that link will work for you. Um, and then while while we're doing that. We will, uh, dependable auto truck, which is Howard. This is, um, yeah. What do you have on your 97 S10 blazer? Um, he says he has a, has a question. You can go ahead and throw the question in there and we will, uh, and we'll discuss it. It, hopefully I can answer it. If not, I'm sure there's somebody in the group that, uh, that can get a handle on it. And, and joining in on the Zoom um, takes some, some getting used to. Let me see here, because I'll have to let you in as well, I believe, once you get logged in. And then hopefully there, there might be a slight delay because we're working all the way across the country and a little bit to the north. Um, those of you that don't know, um, Pico and Sabin are from Nova Scotia. So they are, they are way up there. <laughs> and Corey has already found the solution to the 97S10. It needs a spider injection conversion kit. <laughs> Okay, Saban's still installing Zoom. Um, so Howard, go ahead and... <laughs> no, we're way down here. They're not way up there. We're way down here. Um, Howard, go ahead and post your question on the 97S10. <laughs> now, 
Uh, either that or the distributor sink is off. And since it's a 4.3 liter, it's not adjustable. And you're going to have to hog out the, the hold down for the distributor to get that right. Uh, if there's any questions that I missed, let me know because I don't always have a good chance to read and catch up on the chat. Um, I think I think uh, I got them all handled. I probably missed several comments in there. <laughs> I'm just flipping through here. Um, I, I see Michael Nicholson talking about eyeliner. <laughs> and I, oh, hi, he's I said highlander. Not my, not my eyeliner. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was filming a maintenance video on my Highlander. I bought some... I'll, I'll spoil the surprise a little bit. Valerie doesn't know this either. I, I bought some wheels from the pick and pull. There's a Highlander there that had a decent set of wheels. If I was missing one... So I was like, ah, dang it. So I walked a few rows over and there's the wheel sitting there. I'm like, well, sweet. So I went back and got the other, the other three and I went to order tires. I was like, oh, I need to make sure what sizes are. And they were a 16 inch wheel instead of a 17 inch wheel. But the Highlanders had both options. Um, mine's a hybrid limited. Um, so I had the 17 inch wheel option. So I bought some snow tires. I got them all mounted up. I had one of my employees mount them up for me yesterday and I went to put them on this evening, and they don't clear the brake caliper. So we're just going to take that off. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to take off the brakes. Um, so I, I have to make a decision. Um, I suppose that I probably could get away with putting the 16-inch brake rotor and caliper bracket on there. And it'd probably work just fine. Everything would be good. Um, and it'd probably be cheaper than than selling the current wheels and tires that I just bought and getting the right stuff. <laughs> yes, it was an expensive mistake. Um, especially because the price of tires have gone up a lot. Last time I bought snow tires, which was two years ago, they were like 65 or 70 bucks a piece. And this time they were like 110. So, yeah, I... I'm going to look and see what my options are for selling them. If I can get my money close to my money back out of them, then I'll sell them. Um, if not, then I may, I may make it a, a change to the, to the braking system. Um, it'll, it'll just be like a winter small brake package. <laughs> the last few sets have been takeoffs. Okay. Let me see here. I can add saving in here. Um, so he's joining in the Zoom meeting right now. Once I have him connected in here, then we will, I'll switch over to the other window. Because as soon as I switch over to the, to the Zoom meeting, our quality goes in half. Um, and this is going to be kind of a practice run because one thing I would like to do in the future is make it to where we can bring guests in easily and have them discuss their waveforms. So what I'll probably do is I'll, uh, okay, he's still connecting to audio, so I can't hear you quite yet. And we will let the viewers give us the information for their own waveform. And then before I, before I have, okay, it sounds like you muted your YouTube feed because you're probably getting a different feed now, Saban. Yep, I can hear you. Um, I don't have you up on YouTube yet, so I will, let me, let me transfer that over. And do you want, do you want to be on video? I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll ask your permission before I add you. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, so I, I have to make a decision. Um, I suppose that I, oh, now I'm getting a loop again. Um, where's it coming from? And then, Saban, do you have your YouTube playing still? Okay. We're almost ready. <laughs> and I will. Um, I can't hear him. 
YouTube. So my YouTube's now out of the question. Okay. And now hopefully since I just uh, unmuted that screen, everyone else can hear me and hear Saban, hopefully. Yeah. Valerie gives, give me the okay. Okay. Yep. Perfect. I'm going to pull the Pico screen up. Maybe here. And then you can cover um, what's going on here. Um, and if you want me to zoom in here, I can as well. Okay. So let me just get geared up here. So I guess I'm live with everybody uh, first time. So just bear with me. Um, so basically what this car ended up coming in as was a no start at times. It was uh, intermittent. Um, Pico, which is obviously you guys know that guy. Um, he ended up bringing it in and checking it out. And um, there was a fuel pump installed on the car for a no start. Um, the car started great and never had no issues. And a week and a half later, the car comes back as a no start again. So we tried to hook up the Pico scope and try to utilize all four channels to be the, you know, use what we had to work with. So in the, in this image, what we've done was this is actually probably the second or third caption that we took in the diagnostic stage. Um, I don't think Pico sent you anything other than this, did he, or? No, this was it. This was it. Okay. So just a quick on how we got to this point was we, we, we suspected fuel for, uh, for the same issue why it was in the first time. So we had our, uh, we had our fuel pump, our cam, and uh, sorry, we had our fuel pump. We had our injector control, and we also had ignition, and we had battery voltage. We wanted to see when this thing was cranking over what we was missing. And we noticed on the first image that you guys don't have is that our injector pulse would drop out. So when we had a wide screen, our injector pulse was dropping out. That's what led us to go to this capture, which was to try to find out why our injector was not getting turned on. Um, that's what led us to the blue trace, which was our crank signal. We extended crank, the car would not start and you would see it cut in and out as you can as you've already mentioned earlier in the video, I think right around like the 35 second, 35 second is where the crank dropped out. And you can see the green trace, which was our injector control or ground side on injector for our signal. That actually, you can see the injector there, the green, the green wire actually dropped out as well. Um, upon further investigation, what we found was we wanted to back probe at the ECM and when we did that, we noticed there was a, an oily, thick substance on those. And in there, there was a typo. It was supposed to be terminals 26 and 27, which one was the 26 was the crank and terminal 27 was the cam. And what we noticed was as we wiggled that connector while we was trying to crank the vehicle, the crank would come in and out and it would vehicle could start and then it would stop and, and so on. And then once we got looking at it even further, you could see that uh, the inductive coming from the crank signal actually showing up onto the cam signal in those smaller humps just before the big peaks there. As you can see, they lined up perfectly, right? So what was going on was we had poor pin fits at the ECM given from the oil substance on there, as well as that same oil substance was creating a continuity between the cam and crank signal wires, which was allowing it to bleed off into the cam signal. And uh, so Pico then removed those terminals or the ECM connector, um, replaced those and the car, we do, I don't think he sent you the after picture either, but the after picture, there was none of that spike going from the crank to the cam as well as this car did not miss a beat and it was probably something we wouldn't have been able to catch without using a scope. Yeah. I don't, I can't think of any way that you would be able to identify that without a scope. No. Um, so that's a good catch. Now, did you guys find the source of the oil? Um, no, we didn't. The very first thing that came to mind was leaving the crank sensor on that underneath the intake. There's actually a connector there that before it leads to the ECM, there's actually a connector there. Um, we unplugged that um, and there was no sign of any oil on there, which 
they should have pulled there prior to you know wicking up through the wire and ending up in the ECM. So we could not find any identification why that happened. There's and it's not it it's an oil substance, but it's even thicker. It's it, it's hard to explain. Uh, what what engine did this have? Was it a four cylinder? Yeah, four cylinder, one eight. Yeah. So I'm trying to trying to think here um, of what what I've heard or what I've seen cause that. Um, yeah. I don't remember if those ones have a power steering pressure switch. I know that's kind of common on the on the Chrysler vehicles for leaking and bleeding oh. into the the harness. Uh, but okay. Toyota likes to use a lot of vacuum power steering pressure switches for for idle up, so that may not be the case. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was a, it was quite a neat find. Um, yeah, I mean we like I said the first four to- the first time we had the scope on we had four different channels on which we didn't go after the the crank sensor was hard to get at even the connector under the intake and even to go in and back probe the ecm on this thing was in behind the glove box so that was kind of it wasn't our easiest steps that we wanted to take at first so our first thing we wanted to see what we was missing and like i said in the first image it showed you it was only like one or two injector dropouts in the whole caption right in the whole in the whole uh in the whole waveform yeah um, and then once we saw that, well, then that's when we started chasing this. But realistically, this whole time frame of what we'd done was probably within 25 minutes of chasing down to find, okay, then we had a crank sensor igno- uh, crank sensor issue, which then led us to then go to the ECM and, and find all the oil problems and all that stuff. So Now, a hypothetical question. If you guys yes. didn't back probe at the ECM, and you were scoping it at the cam and crank sensor and you saw this signal, what would your next step have been? Uh, honestly, um, the, the, we, we did go straight to the ECMs. It's hard if it's hard to answer backwards, but we went straight to the ECM because it was the easiest spot to get to. Um, if, if I had saw that signal at the connector down below, most likely I would have suspected maybe a failing uh, crank sensor at times. Yeah. Right. Like, I, like I, I agree a hundred percent. That's right? probably where I would have went. Yes. And that, and, but, and, and with that being said, but when, but one of the other things that led us there too, as well was when we was, when we had our back, back probe pins in that ECM connector, once we wiggled things, you, you'd start to see a change. Okay. So there was obviously two of us there. We was trying to confirm that we had good connection between the pins because it was a hard spot to get at. So Pico was in underneath the dash. We had another gentleman cranking the engine. I was running the scope and it seemed like if I seen him move or if he said, I'm, I'm moving the pin, we'd have a different result where our crank, uh, our crank signal would kind of come in and out a little bit. Mm. So that kind of give us a good indication to not chase the crank sensor as well. Right. Yeah. So, which I mean, at that part was kind of a lucky find that soon with with what it was, but yeah. Cool, excellent. Uh, did you have anything else to add? Um, no, other than thanks, guys, um, and thanks for everybody that's joining on board and and uh, and watching live and stuff. That's awesome, you guys. You and Val both do a great job, and we appreciate it. So it's the first time on Zoom. We just I just downloaded it, <laughs> and hopefully it was a learning experience for both of us that'll make things smoother the, down the road. Awesome. I appreciate you for joining in. Um, yep. Like I said, this is something I want to do in the future. So if you guys have waveforms in the future that you want to share via via Zoom, then yep. let me know and we will we'll do a, a Zoom meeting again and we'll yep. just invite people in. Hopefully I'll have the settings figured out a little bit better so my Zoom call doesn't end halfway through our live stream. Yeah, no worries. So, uh, thanks and I'll I'll see you guys in the next one. Actually, I'm going to jump over to the other screen here. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, guys and and gals. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you, Sabin, for joining in. Um, Like I said, I, I can't explain it nearly as well as some of you guys can. You're the ones that are out in the field testing this stuff. I just kind of fumble through the comments and hopefully, hopefully I get it correct enough to, to not make myself look uh, like an idiot, (laughs) but it's still good fun to make myself look bad. So I'm not too worried about it. Um, 
and and some, sometimes like that it does make a big difference having uh, teamwork you know you got to work as a team in your shop if you need a hand have someone else come over and give you a hand and even if they're just watching the scope and and just telling you if something changes that's all you need um, I can grab any of the guys in the shop and say hey tell me if this signal changes they don't have to look at the waveform or analyze it or anything or I'll say if this changes hit the spacebar button and stop that capture so I can see what happened Yeah, I can see why you wanted to send it to me and not just cover it. Um, and it, it worked so much better having having the Zoom meeting. So you guys keep this in mind for future captures. If you have a specific um, way of testing something or a specific explanation um, and you're not camera shy and want to join in on the on the Zoom call or into the live stream, then, uh, then that's something we can do. We'll probably just, uh, I'll private message you the link or I'll set it up to where you can get the link. And then... Uh, Cause I'm sure that if I, if I post it on the internet, I'll get a whole bunch of people joining, <laughs> joining in that, um, possibly shouldn't, um, anything else? Did I miss anything, Valerie? Yeah. Thank you for turning my mic on. No, he didn't miss anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I will have to edit the video tomorrow morning and then get that uploaded. We are going to jump into ignition system. Um, we shouldn't need any tools that we haven't used already or that I haven't mentioned already. Um, so you don't have to prepare yourself for anything. Um, I'm, I'm trying to limit how much stuff we need to buy and I'll try to explain if it's valuable to you or not, whether or not you need it, um, if you're gonna be doing a specific type of testing. I think we'll end this one here. Uh, thanks everyone for joining out. Thank you, Saban and uh, Pico for for sharing that with us so that we can see what you guys had and Saban for jumping on here and explaining that. Um, good night, everybody, and see you next time.